I don't know how the light looks behind us, but I'm watching this light. You're, what, you're this welcome. Getting better. You're I welcome. Know, this guy. You had the vision. This is, I mean, honestly, it wouldn't even occur to me. And as I tell people we're filming in Central Park, they're like, can you even do that? Well, as a matter of fact, you can. No, we can. It just made me really believe that we're, like, when we allow ourselves to really open up mm. to possibility, mm -hmm. that we can get answers. There's a dynamic, like, that we can be in a dynamic interplay with our environment. Mm. Which is part of the philosophy that I'm starting to embrace with downshift, mm -hmm. with transition, which is this idea that um, most of the time, and when I was a VC, I very much, I was a solo actor, kind of moving through the world. Yep. I have agency, and the deeper I've gone into this journey is like, actually, we are individual complex systems nested in a very complex world that's completely indescribable. And that we can be in relationship when we realize that our environment influences us as much as we in influence our environment, mm -hmm. it just changes the entire way that you see things. Mm. And it's this like interdependency, this unity, this, this like oneness with everything. Did you resist? Did you, but did you resist that? Because I um, do feel like when I look at the times that I've known you, yeah, which is probably, I mean, we're probably going on what, like, ten years. I'm gonna wear my glasses. Are you gonna wear your glasses for oh, this? Oh, I can take them off. Well, I don't know. It's the vibe that we want to. I feel like your world opened up to you completely over the last six months. It started when I left New York and moved to Stone And that was Ridge. what, that was a year ago? Uh, a year ago in June, so what, 15 months? Yeah, okay. And it was a really random encounter where, you know, I, I have studied uh, Buddhist philosophy and, you know, this idea of like oneness. Yeah. It's like definitely like something on my radar and I had tastes of it. And then I leave New York and I'm upstate and all of a sudden, I started hearing raining sound, like from the trees. And I like look up and I was like, it's perfectly sunny out, why is it raining? And then I got really curious and yeah. I'm like, what's on the road? And it turns out that there was a explosion of an invasive species of caterpillar. What? This is real? Yeah. This is really happening? Yeah, it's okay. like a black mossy caterpillar. So they're and in they, your trees. And, they, and basically eating the leaves because, um, you know, caterpillars are consumers, moths yeah. are pollinators, right. and they're just raining shit down from the trees. And I start, and in that moment, like, I'm like, there's something going on. Yeah. Like, there's, there's like an aliveness mm -hmm. that's not typical. And you never noticed that before. Never, be, yeah. and because it was cyclical, yeah. right? It was just every 10 years, you get this cycle. Yep. And then I started just opening up my senses and it's like, wow, actually there's not four seasons. There's a whole range of micro seasons. Turns out that's true. Yeah. Um, the Japanese, I think, have identified like 45 or 47 of them. Okay. But just kind of like being embedded in nature and just mm -hmm. seeing these like gradual changes and cycles mm -hmm. and it's like, whoa, okay. There's something way bigger going on here that I have no control over. Mm. And so that started to open me up to being in relation, more in relationship with it. I was going to say, you had started that journey way earlier, right? I mean... Yeah, a decade ago. It started a decade ago, really. And what, what initiated it back then? Because I think when we met, you were like a very alpha, oh, yeah. high-strung junior partner, junior VC, yeah. doing what every really good junior VC does, which is like- Hustle. Hustle like hell. I mean, you were, gr you had New York in a chokehold for a while. I did. You did. There was like 2010 to 2014, August 2014, where mm. I was like after it. Nonstop, yeah. Nonstop. I had two experiences. I went away to France for my brother-in-law's wedding mm -hmm. a decade ago and I started to, I opened up Kindle, my Kindle, and I got at, I got an ad for The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. Okay. And I'm like, so many people have recommended this book, I'm gonna read it. Mm -hmm. And so I downloaded it, being like, yeah, maybe I'll read it. I started reading it, 
and it just like completely knocked me on my ass. And I'm like, oh, I'm so far. Did you know the... you were looking for it no. at that point? Really? No. What were you? I, was there something you were feeling at the time that it unlocked that was maybe subconscious? It, it was almost like if I had to give an emotional quality, there was like sadness. Oh. There's like a concept in, in Buddhism, like the hungry ghost, hmm. sort of like this this image of a ghost with like a, an overfull belly, but you can never satiate that appetite. Yeah, yeah. And for me, I so oh, identified with it. Like... And I was always about the next, the next deal, the, the, the next, next event, dopamine the, hit, totally. the net. And, and I was like, oh, I'm, I've just constantly been living in the future. Mm -hmm. And I went for a run the day of my brother's wedding. And I'm like running along this country road in Northern France, it's like picturesque. And there's a group of cows and they just follow me with their eyes. Like their consciousness was so lit up yeah. and I, it was like very moving. And I came home from that trip and I'm like, I'm going to learn how to meditate. And wow. that's what kicked me off on this journey. Was there anything behind those gazing cows where you're like, you're saying I wish I were that present, which must have meant you felt like you totally were not present at all in your no, life. No, I the... definitely wasn't. And at that time, and I've written extensively about this, but I was smoking weed every day yeah. just to kind of take that edge off oh, because that speed was really harming me mm -hmm. without me even realizing it. And I was like, the only way I can slow down at the end of every day mm -hmm. is by smoking a little bit of cannabis. Yeah. And that for many years was my, even though I was a high achiever, you know, top of my class in college, always did well in my career. At the end of every day, I had to get every day, every day. Okay. And towards I would the end, at a certain point, the edge isn't coming off. Well, and towards <laughs> the end, of, and towards the end of it, I got sober June of 2015. Okay. So almost a year after I read The Power of Now, I was just so fed up. I'm like, I'm gonna kill myself. Like wow. I'll get in a car accident, I'll ruin my marriage. Something, I'm gonna get ill from the way I'm treating myself and something has to give. And that's what it was. There was no like blackout experience. In, actually in 2015, about four mo five months out before I got sober, I went to the Super Bowl. Mm. Actually, I went to the Upfront Summit. Okay. And like, was up really late, like going hard. I remember it was a Friday, the Friday before the Super Bowl in LA, and I was so hungover. Mm. My best friend flew in. Mm -hmm. We drove to Arizona to watch the Pats play the Seahawks, <laughs> which was a great game. <laughs> I mean, incredible to watch. Right. But there, I mean, it was we, Saturday night, we went to a Roots concert. Someone hands me a joint. We had been drinking all day, and next thing I know, I'm surrounded by paramedics. I swear to God, I've written about it. And, and I wrote about it in the context of a friend of mine texted me, one of my oldest friends in the world, texted me maybe like 18 months ago. And he's like, was it the 10 day meditation retreat? Was that the thing that like kind of catalyzed mm. this transformation? And I said, no, it was actually me hitting the floor at a Roots concert. <laughs> That was, that was when I was like, yeah, something. Were you still at RRE at that point? I or? was. You were, okay. Yeah, and I was, I was spooked because the paramedics, I, I woke up and like knew exactly what happened and I like come to my senses and I'm like, my name's Steve Schlafman. This oh, is wow. where I'm okay. from. Yeah. Like they, like, they oh, did a whole work. your first rodeo. Yeah, and they, and they did a whole workup and they let me walk off with my friends and I remember we went to a diner that night yeah. and I was just like shook. I bet. And I was just like, some, some, something, something now has to give. Like, yeah. I'm 35 years old. I have, you know, I'm on the verge to mega success. I have the wife. I have a house up, like all the, but like, there must be something deep inside that I need to look at. Mm -hmm. And then that's what, that's what started. Were you surprised when you started to look inside of it? No. Really? No. There have definitely been surprises along the last 10 years in that through that process or nine years. But it's almost like the deeper I go into this journey, the more I realize that it's kind of infinite. Yeah. And that like, like the more I go into my relationship with my parents or I look at the way that my wife triggers me or the way I interact with my kids. It's, it's like, oh, there it is. Mm. I'd say like there are times where 
I will have certain experiences, whether it's breath work and psychedelics, where I'm starting to embrace all of these uh, parts of myself mm -hmm. that I've discovered in those 10 years. Wow. And, and there's a common theme and actually a scene that I keep on coming back to, whether it's breath work, like holotropic type breath work or psychedelics, where for some reason, this Same has scene, happened over and over. four times. Okay. I go back to my summer camp. As a kid? As a kid, I was there for 12 years of my life. Okay. Each time I go back, there are varying kind of expressions of this experience. But the last one was me standing at the top of the hill. It's like picturesque. There's like bunks lining the street or like the sort of the campus. And then you can see the lake. I mean, it's gorgeous. Yeah. And I'm at the top of the hill. American flag, Rose Arbor, and there's hundreds of versions of myself. Wow. All different ages. Okay. And what I'm starting to realize is this like embracing of all of these parts of myself. Did the you... parts of myself that, sorry to jump no, in, no, please. that were frankly like unbearable to be with and like carried a lot of shame mm. or did things that I had a lot of shame around. Was that part of the fuel that made you so great in venture, such a hustler in venture? I, I think at the core of it, I grew up um, so fascinating because like my dad, my dad pushed my older brother, but he never pushed my, I'm an identical twin. I'm not sure if you I knew that. that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's just like in, in high school, I was always into sports and was never like the best athlete, but always worked hard. Yeah. You know, it's sort of like I got the Charlie Hustle Award mm -hmm. le legitimately. Yeah. And I got to college and I had no athletics. And it's like, well, what am I going to throw myself into? And it was academics. Okay. And then it became business. Mm -hmm. And so it was like this constant, like needing to achieve and prove myself mm -hmm. and like this, this chip on my shoulder. How hard was it to achieve in venture? Or how hard was it to kind of scratch that achievement itch in venture? I loved it for a long time until I got conscious. And then I realized for me- What it, did you, when you were loving it, what did you love about it? Oh, I loved the people. Yeah. I love the, hearing the stories of entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and their journeys and how they conceived of the ideas. Um, I love like the challenge of having to make decisions. Mm -hmm. I loved like being on a team and collaborating and debating. Like I always viewed my role in venture as a point guard. Mm -hmm. Whereas like, yeah, I had to make decisions, but I love just having a sh super wide funnel yeah. and then being able to dish it yeah. to my partners and like I, I always believed in a very collaborative approach yeah and uh yeah there was a lot i loved about it i love i love going out to not even like drinking i love like going and learning about where the world is heading mm -hmm. could this version of you still be a vc i think about it all the time i bet i i believe i could be there are times where i actually think about it where I believe I could be, but only in the right environment and team. I wouldn't want to do it by myself, mm -hmm. and I would want. Because it. it seemed like you tried a few different hats on. Post and I just I, I started my co the coaching path. That's right. But I was also like um, you, venture was still a part of your story post RE through a few through, iterations yeah, of yourself. Th there was right? there was a six month sabbatical. That's right. Where I started coaching because I felt really called to it. Yeah. yeah. Then there was, let's see, I'm trying to you were think. You going to start a fund. Then, no, then I went to primary. Oh, that's oh right. I, no, I was going to start a fund that's called right. Genuine. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That integrated coaching and leadership I development, what right. I call holistic leadership yeah. development. Right. And then finally I was like, I don't want to work by myself. And I knew the primary guys and they're like, hey, come. And it's like one of the top early stage funds in New York. Yep. I've known them forever. And I was there for 18 months and I was like doing the coaching thing on the side. And, and I was just like, this isn't, it just didn't feel the right fit. And mm. no disrespect to them. Sure. Like they built a massive platform. And for me, my, my perspective on venture, whether right or wrong, I'm not, is I'm a big fan of very small teams, mm -hmm. highly collaborative, 
not a lot of overhead, and they wanted to go in another yeah, direction. Totally opposite. To direction. Total opposite. Yeah. And at that point in time, I was like, you know, I tried primary, I've tried Lear, I've tried RRE, I've tried primary. At a certain point in time, it can't be the firm, it has to be me. Right, right. And I was like, I'm gonna go and coach full time. And sure enough, I went, I was convinced, my friends were like, oh, let me invest in you. And that was the time everyone was raising these oh, angel right. funds. Yeah, the angel and I raised thing. basically like a small little angel fund that I invested for a year. Okay. And then I was like, okay, I'm, I'm done. But going back to investing, I think about it all the time because I've done so much work on myself mm -hmm. that there is a lot of, there's been a lot of reflection on the tendencies mm -hmm. that got in my way of being a great investor. Yeah. So um, that ship has probably sailed at this point, but I. Think so. I uh, well, one thing yeah, that's always interesting to me is I feel like you are maybe the most polarizing guy in New York venture. Really? Yeah. It's a part of me that loves to hear you say that. I think there's a surprising number of people who feel betrayed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like there's a surprising I, I number can, of people who think, feel like you're, yeah. you quit. Yeah. Like venture works on a shared delusion. Yeah. Well, and as long as we're, we all agree on this delusion that we're a part of, which is there's one way to do this, there's you know time frames, there's dollar amounts, there's valuations, there's this very discreet way to think about doing your life's work, then we all can win together. But with you raising your hand and saying like, you kind of like pierce the veil a bit. You've been an insider yeah. and then you, you know, from the outside looking in, you're saying maybe there's a different way to think about doing this. Yeah. So a few things just to note, like, because I'm, I do the work myself. Yeah. Like, as I heard you say that, I noticed my energy rise at really? first okay. of like, oh, actually, it's interesting that people will say that. And then I noticed in my system sadness. Oh, interesting. Sadness. Okay, why sadness? Um, because I, there is a part of me that knows I could have been great <laughs> on the right team. Mm. And I just never, it's, I had a conversation with Satya Patel. Yeah. And I remember him saying, you're just going to have to go create your own pond. Mm. And, and in some ways, I took that as not say like I this is how I interpret it is I need to go do it on my own mm -hmm. versus let's go take some time to really find the right place mm -hmm. and it's a big reason why I'm, I'm now working on downshift is because I could never slow down and really feel into what I wanted slowing down is and what and what upon in I, our world I know and and to the point about piercing the veil I remember three months after I decided I, I, had ra I, had, I was going to raise a, a much bigger fund. I decided to walk away. Three months later, a friend's like, do you miss it at all? And I was like, you know what? I'll, I'm going to give you an analogy. Imagine I'm, I'm floating in outer space and I see planet Earth in front of me. Mm -hmm. And I'm just floating away from it by myself. Mm -hmm. And I don't care. Like I'm actually relaxing. Wow as I as I float away. And what's interesting is as I've studied transitions and change and transformation, what often happens um, in these very deep transformations when someone's identity is so tied up into something um, that a number of things happens. First, when you disengage, there, there's sort of like a disengagement process, which we've For been sure. talking yeah. about. There's a disidentification process where you stop identifying as the thing that you were. You begin to dismantle some relationships, um, routines, mm -hmm. structures. Move and, upstate. Yeah. You then <laughs> become disillusioned. Yeah. And then what often happens is a sense of disorientation. Mm. But I want to talk about the disillusionment. Yeah after I disengage and I decide is what I started to realize is that um, 
and and as someone that identifies as a former addict, like I was in a casino. Yeah. And that was, yeah, that everybody was saying that it was a legalized casino mm -hmm. and one that celebrated and and by the way, I'm, ton of status, ton of status, yep. ability to generate a lot of wealth, yep. and it just at the end of the day, it just didn't make a lot of sense. Like I was getting like that dopamine hit from deploying the capital, but then it sort of lacked a lot of like substance mm -hmm. where a lot of the, like there were a lot of deep special relationships, some of which I still have, like, yeah, like absolutely. ours and others, but it was very transactional. And when I started to like clean up my act and get conscious, I was yeah. like, I want like, I want authentic, genuine connections where I can just meet another human and be with them and not have- There's no angle no angle, no armoring. And but that's very real. I mean, it's very hard. I mean, my wife and I talk about this all the time. It's so... It's natural. It's so ingrained. It is. I've been doing this now 20 plus years. And so every conversation I go into, my guard is always up. I understand. Because it's like, you're, I'm gonna, somebody's gonna hit me with something. And it'll feel genuine at some point, and pretty soon it turns out it's actually... Yeah. And I did not want my guard up. No, I bet. Like, I wanted to, you know, yeah. live live openly. And I think and I've learned how to, A, probably be better at discerning, you know, be more skeptical. Yeah. And I think just better at being very direct. Yeah. You know, up front. Like, venture blurs the lines so much between, like, real life and real friendships and transactional relationships. Yeah, it was it was fully integrated. Yeah. All my friends were of VCs course. or founders. Yeah. There's actually a really important place in the ecosystem for venture capital. Of course, yeah. yeah. But upon reflecting, there was just so many companies started that were raising venture just for the sake of raising because yeah. it was easy and people were throwing money at great entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. That to me kind of kind of seems broken. I remember having this epiphany. It's not like this is like groundbreaking. But I remember having a conversation with the founder. He's like, oh, I'm gonna raise 10 million, no problem. And I was like, just stop for a second. You're not raising 10 million. You're selling $10 million worth of your business. Right. And it, what started to happen... Did that reframing was, change the way they thought about it or just for ab you personally? Absolutely. Okay. But I think like it, it just became so easy. And what I think happened is there was a lot of discipline that just went out the window. Mm. Is that a factor at all in your, like the beginning of your disillusionment? The ease with which the way the kind of culture became more transactional. No, that 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 no. I mean that was a big part of it, especially okay. towards the end. Yeah, yeah. Like how cutthroat it was, the sharp elbows, it wasn't collaborative anymore. Yeah. I'm I'm lingering on this term disillusionment because I actually hear so many, particularly early career VCs, feeling incredibly disillusioned because the venture world they entered is not the venture world that they're inhabiting right now. Right. Five years ago, firms moved at a very different pace. They had a different set of incentives. Now people are feeling like they're party planners. They yeah. are feeling like this is, might actually be really hard. Yeah. You know, it might not be what they thought they were signing up for. And so I'm watching, you know, this kind of universe of, you know, People who aspired, I mean, as you know, you know, like, it's a very aspirational, high status job. It is. And so people wrestling with why does it feel so wrong? <laughs> why does it feel so empty? Why does it, you know, and I, and I think there is that part of it where it's like, wait, this isn't at all what I thought it was supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think the thing that I, I struggled a lot with was I was seeing this, like I could feel it coming. So I, I decided not to go do a second angel fund yeah. or completely hang it up in the summer of 2021. 
wow. literally right before the peak. Yeah. And I was like, everyone in their college roommates raising a venture fund, valuations are crazy. Like it just feels like. We're so there's the quantitative stuff. What was happening inside of you that made you decide not to? Oh well, well towards the end, I would I would sit in pitches, and just be like, you know, I don't really care. <laughs> I don't care. It's, I mean, about, you're vocalizing I, what I hear. I, I, you're, I don't. I you're don't. Saying publicly what yeah. I hear. Every, so many people. I, I don't saying really it care about the tenth SaaS company building yeah. workflow automation software. Yeah. All due respect to those invest totally. those entrepreneurs yeah. that are sacrificing years of their life to solve that problem. I just don't give a shit. Yeah. I just don't. Mm -hmm. And for me. I think this is what brought me into coaching and this idea of having these authentic relationships mm -hmm. and that are like based on like really like unconditional positive regard and like love yeah. and respect is that all I had more friends that are that were founders than investors as you know as you know my wife is a, is an right. entrepreneur That's right. and I just had so much empathy for them mm -hmm. in their journey and just being in partner meetings and and like, even though investors are like, oh, we're the most founder friendly firm in the world. And there are a lot of founder friendly investors. I just was like, just being on that other side of the table and not really being able to like have a space where they could open up. Mm -hmm. It's like, I didn't want to play that role anymore where I was providing capital and advice. Yeah. So how did that transition start then from capital and advice to just advice? Because I think you tried to do both. You know, it seemed to me like there was a time in your I, venture I, investing where you're like, I can be the coach. I can, I can be the I coach. can do this. Why couldn't that work to be like the investor coach versus just a coach? Well, I think for starters, I didn't want to be in pitches all That's day. so interesting. You were just over it. I was just burnt out. Yeah? I was toast. The other thing was sifting because I had tons of deal, deal I know flow. you did. Yeah. Tons of volume. Right sifting through all the decks and you know making the decision and what i found was it was actually prohibiting me like all those parts of the job from doing the thing where it's just like how do i show up and be a service to another human being sure yeah um so that's kind of that's how it started okay yeah the other the other thing i would say about the venture business that didn't allow me to that to commingle is i Julian Smith from Breather. Yeah. I was on his board, loved Julian. And I remember I left RRE and he and I are sitting in a breather and we're having a very intimate conversation mm -hmm. because now I'm like no longer on his board. And he's like, I don't know if I can do this job anymore. That's and I was like, amazing. I was like, obviously it's with like, I'll, this will, this will stay with me. And, and he said, and I was like, ask you a question why why couldn't you bring that up to me you know three months ago right um you, you know i would have been i would have held that in confidence and he said because you know anytime there's a there's a follow-on check on the line yeah the power dynamic you know the, the, a wall goes up yeah and sure. there's a there's a real power dynamic yep. and time it's funny that, it's actually why i stopped serving on boards yeah because i would have very similar experiences with people where they felt like the power dynamic was skewed or that there would be some repercussion yeah. to being really honest about yeah. what was going on. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, there are some days I miss it. There are some days I miss it. The other thing is, is I feel like it's a young person's game. Oh, interesting. Okay. I'm sitting here with gray hair. Yeah. Well, no, you're, but, but I think there requires a level of energy and right. enthusiasm and curiosity. I have a toddler, two-year-old, six-year-old. Oh, dude. And, I mean, you, you've been through it more times than that. <laughs> and uh, Yes, I have. I just don't know if I, I, I have that same level of energy. Yeah. And I, and I want to be involved in my, in my kids. But, you know, it's interesting because I look, a, a few weeks ago, I ran into a very good friend of mine who around the same time, you know, I, I left, he went and built his own firm. And oh, ra raise venture fund, venture okay. fund raise like a hundred plus million. Yeah, and so so like pretty good opening fund, and we bumped into each other. And we're buddies, and I was just thinking like, wow, like my life is a complete one eighty. Went from like 
back to back to back to back meetings sure. from the moment I woke up till you know email at night and not and constantly running around town and breakfast at Balthasar and tech meetups and the Absolutely. whole thing to now I literally live in the woods right and I'm like very different I work nine to five mm -hmm. or a little bit more than that I pick my hours if I want to take a month off I take a month off mm -hmm. And let's be clear, I'm not financially secure. Like, I'm secure, yeah. but I I by no means can retire. Sure. Like, I left before I made my money. Yeah. And so, which was a conscious decision that I made. Really? Yeah. How so? Because I, I one of my big fears is I grew up, I was raised by a single mother, worked two jobs. God bless her. She complained about money every single day yeah. of my upbringing. Mm -hmm. So naturally programmed inside of me is this feeling of not enough. Yeah. Like I could, I could have 20 million in the bank and it wouldn't be enough. Yep. And, and it, I got, I actually had a big realization where when I was leaving RRE, I had a chance to sell a, like a little bit of my stake, mm -hmm. not enough to retire, not even close. But enough to like give me a little bit of breathing room, yep. and I remember hitting my bank account and be like, "I feel no different." Yeah, that's how it works. Yeah, no yeah. different. Yeah. And then I'm like, "Oh." And actually, the, the the number of zeros doesn't actually change it that much. Well, that and 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 that's what I realized, and so I'm like, "It's if, incredibly deflating." If if this doesn't change it, then this actually isn't what matters. Yeah. What matters is like, for me, is like being in great relationships, authentic conversations, being in nature, yeah. and like, Jazz, ha and, yeah, being a dad, like, yeah. ability to learn, like, yeah. being in a new career, it's like I get to immerse myself in this, like, like large world of, you know, coaching and healing and psychology mm -hmm. and spiritual, it's just, it, it's like a sandbox that is endless. If you could go back in time, is there a more sustainable way to have done venture than you were doing it back then? Because it seems like you were pegged at 11. I don't know if there's an in-between that would work for you between all out all the time to the woods outside of yeah. you know, an upstate. I, I've, I've thought about this. Um, I, I don't know exactly what it would but look But I would like. imagine there's somebody in venture right now who's really wrestling with that. Yeah, here, here's a big change I would make, which kind of sounds, par I mean, it's antithetical to the way that I used to behave, mm -hmm. which was, back-to-back -back meetings all day long. Hmm. And if I could do venture over again, or I had a second chance, I would probably wouldn't schedule any meetings until noon. Okay, so leave the mornings open. And I would, I would basically do research. Oh, and I would read, research. and I would learn, mm -hmm. and I would, I would give myself more space to think and process mm -hmm. versus do. Yeah. <laughs> that, I had a that tweet would, a while that, ago that went crazy. There was something like normalized uh, thinking is working. Yeah. And you know, because I think so many people feel like they need like motion and movement and action is working and not the process. Yeah. The other would be to obviously work with a, a partner or a set of partners that shared a lot of the same values. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think to be to have some semblance of success you have to work hard. Of course. But yeah. I, I think I think there's a difference between you know bringing yourself to burnout and feeling like the right level of challenge and stimulus and yeah. I think it like and to me like what I'm feeling into in this next chapter is like what I'm realizing is that and this is how I'm I'm, be, I'm Take, carrying myself now is that there are there are cycles of effort and recovery yeah. effort and recovery effort and recovery and when you look at any high performing athlete literally that's the whole deal yeah and so how do you build that into your days into mm -hmm. your weeks into your months and in the, the annual calendar yeah. checking in with myself yeah what's my level of energy where's my cur curiosity my creative energy um what's my capacity mm -hmm. to actually do this job effectively why couldn't you listen to your intuition back then do you think you heard it there were you there, felt it there were there were times where i felt it perfect example is 
when I met Keller from Zipline. Mm -hmm. I was at Lair. I'd been on the job for not even a year. Mm. I think it was December of 2010 or 11. I'd been in the job four months. Mm. And I remember him, this is when they were working on Remotive before he pivoted to Zipline. Yeah. Just the way he told the story. Yeah. Like, I don't give a shit if this guy's selling robots or, or ice to Eskimos. Right. I want to back this guy. Oh, it was just like, there's no debate in my head about, uh, it was just like, yes. Yeah. As I'm kind of standing up India again, one of the things that I've really tried to embrace is like, my biggest winners were my easiest yeses. Yeah. And it's like, for me at least i don't know if it works this way for everybody else but it's the big one yeah you know, the, the ones that have always performed the best are the ones that i've been super decisive on it's been very clear it's the ones you have to talk yourself into so this is the dialogue i pay attention to a lot in my own head as i'm making decisions because you know like there's so many amazing founders out there that are trying putting so much on the line to do these things and yet there's something I'm not the right person yeah. for them yeah. or, or even more you know kind of frustratingly is like that's not the right direction for them to go yeah you know what I mean and I don't know how to pinpoint yeah. it but it's like I think I wasted a lot of energy in my career trying to articulate the inarticulable right mm -hmm. it was like I can't explain to you some of these things like and you probably don't even want to hear what they are. And I found that as I've been really quick and direct with people, it's actually been far more appreciated than like some multi-paragraph explanation about why what's basically an idea to them isn't going to work. It takes a while as an investor to get comfortable enough because it's there. You just have to not fight it. Yeah. Yeah. Because you want to fight it because you meet somebody you really like, or you hear an idea that is so inevitable, but it's like with the wrong person. Yeah. Or I think the thing I probably get more than anything is like amazing person that is working on an idea that's that they're way too good for. Mm. <laughs> I remember hearing that yeah. from Mike Maples once. And yeah. I, he said something like, you know, they're too good for that idea. And it's yeah. just, I think that's yeah. a, that's plaguing yeah. so many people. Yeah, right yeah, now. yeah. Yeah, and I, I see a lot of that. Yeah. I see a lot of that. I wonder if you also see a lot of people who maybe had felt that way, but because the startup industrial complex says never quit, right? put everything on the line. You know, the difference between the person who wins and the person who doesn't is the one who won didn't stop. Yeah, and this isn't, let's be clear, this isn't just a startup no. adventure. This no, is no, no. an American. It's, it's an American, it, for sure. Especially, like, if you look at, like, masculine versus, fat, like, to be masculine is never to give up. Totally. And what, what I see, both in my coaching clients and my friends, is there are cases where you've been immersed in something, long time. I'm thinking of a client right now. He's been working on his company since 2017. Long time. Long time. Wow. Right? And he has top tier investors and he's disillusioned by his industry. Oh, fascinating. When did that disillusionment set in? It's been creeping in has for it? the last year or so. Okay. And, and crypto. Let's just, I'll be, yeah. you know, and he can't be critical of the crypto industry because everyone's holding it all in and it's that shared delusion and, again. <laughs> and, and exactly and and like he's like you know I like I gotta keep on go like I'm gonna get to the end of the year and I have a lot of empathy for him because he's he's burnt out and I'm I'm helping him navigate this path but so in a situation like that are you just like bumpers in a bumper bowling alley or are you saying like Dude, you need to quit. I'm not because he's looking for somebody to give him permission to yeah, do certain things. I'm I'm not that explicit. Okay, most coaches aren't. Yeah, to be clear. no, I'm yeah, yeah. I'm definitely not that explicit. Yeah, yeah. For me, I'm trying to understand 
how he's coming to it. Like, from what place is he coming to it from? Yeah. You know, to him, it's really important that he sees the next card turn. Mm -hmm. And we talked about, well, what happens if you turn the card and it's... And, like, can you be with that fear mm. of, you know, and, and so for and me, what's the I'm holding... Of that fear? Is it source of fearing that he personally failed? Is it having to wind down a company that he raised all the, like, kind of got all this? It's so all the above. Got it. All the above. His whole identity is tied up in this thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I love that. I mean, I love this guy. Right. To somebody like that, what's most helpful? Like, where, where do they get the most value out of, or what are they looking for? Well, I think, um, to me, to me, the way I support him is, for me, it starts with loving presence. Yeah. I know it sounds so, so simple. Mm -hmm. The ability just to be with him, help him process what his experience is, and have enough like we've worked together almost two years so i've also seen wow. a long arc of the journey mm -hmm. and can help him see different patterns that might have been playing out over a longer period of time sure and help him think through what are the options mm -hmm. and from again what place are these are these coming from mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and is he doing it out of a place of fear as we talked about mm -hmm. or is he doing it from a place of agency and can he get to a place where he's making a, a, a decision based on his like clarity that he can ultimately own, even if it's really fucking hard and scary and he's going to have to, you know, potentially go through a, like an identity death, an ego death. That's so intense. It dude. is. It is. It is. But everybody, like not everybody, founders, this is what they go through. This is, Do they have to? Is it just part of the journey, or is it part believe, of like the crucible? Like, does venture put an added layer I, I think, of pressure? I think and this is this is not just venture. I think this I is. I don't think so. I think this is about in life. Like, we have an ego that can shape shift and take on different. Is you know, I'll say it, even though it's it's a it's a word that it can be loaded these days. Is it's fluid. Sure. And that we make our minds make these constructs and we place value on them mm -hmm. and we invest in them and they're reinforced by our friends mm -hmm. and peers and society. And, and so what inevitably happens is that they get reinforced, just like my investor. Totally. Like I went through, I went through a death. Yep. I eventually grieved it. I cried it. Like... Mm -hmm. And I and and I think in life, as we as we evolve, if we allow ourselves to, you know, we have to experiencing the, experience these endings and these deaths. Mm. It's part of life. You could measure your success previously by who's marking up your next company, how much they're raising, how much they're selling for. Like the milestones are like very very clear. Mm -hmm. This one, like, how do you know if you're actually making a difference. In some ways, I've learned to become unattached to outcomes. Okay. Because to me, if I'm holding space with someone and I'm trying to drive someone to a specific outcome, then I, I haven't done my job. Mm. Because then I'm projecting whatever outcome I want to make me feel good about myself. Mm. So it's, it's a different kind of of relationship it's mm -hmm. a different kind of value for me it's again like yes i have to be effective as a coach and like hold the space and challenge and love and all the things and listen and ask questions and be able to bring in the right framework and all these things i have to know how to do but if i'm fixated on adding value and driving outcomes then i'm am i really serving someone I'm just, I have my own agenda. There's a coaching uh, psychotherapy methodology called Hakomi, which I'm now studying that okay. I love. And what is it? And they view having an agenda for your client as violence. That seems it's, crazy. It's. Why would that? Why would. But, why? but let, let me give you an example okay, of how please. this plays out. I worked with a very prominent client, mm -hmm. friend, uh, actually an acquaintance of someone I've known for a decade. Yeah. And he had built something. Very, very 
wasn't a huge business, but very visible mm -hmm. publicly. Okay. And he came to me and is like, I just can't shut this thing down. Should I go sell it? Because um, he was I, done with it. Well, it just, his heart wasn't in it anymore. Okay. But yeah, it yeah. was like big, again, his identity was wrapped up in it. Totally. You know, being on stage with Oprah and very influential guy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, rather than being like, this is exactly what you need to go do, through a process of like three, four months, we looked at this over through all these different dimensions mm. and finally and, and actually one of the things i said was well what if you actually had a grieving process for this mm. once he was sort of feeling into like nature like what you know completing that cycle again coming back to cycles then he was like okay and now let's have a ritual where we're going to memorialize this decision and then he went and like actually made his decision part of a celebration mm. and a and so what I'm trying to say is, like, if I were running my agenda, I would have been like, go sell this thing. You worked so hard on it. Like, get that value. But instead, I just listened to what he valued mm -hmm. and what he really wanted and where he was in his life. And through a very organic process, he ultimately came to his own conclusion. Yeah. And I was like a midwife to that decision, not like the driver of it. Have you noticed a pattern in the flaws in the way people make decisions or the process that gets them to the decision, maybe things that get in the way of them making the right decisions? Yeah. Um, well, again, I, I'm a big fan of, of internal family systems. I use yeah, it a you lot, mentioned in, that before, but a, I don't know a lot in my work. So basically the idea is this, is like... Um, so, so internal family systems was developed by Dr. Richard Schwartz, okay. probably in the early, late 70s, early 80s. Uh -huh. And he was a family counselor. And what he um, was, he was starting to work with pe women and other people that had real trauma mm -hmm. and, and, and really bad um, kind of behavioral uh, and me mental illnesses. And what he would hear is, well, there's a part of me that wants to do this and a part of me that wants to do that. Mm. And he took his family therapy hat on and was like, huh, and started talking to these different parts. And over a number of years, basically realized that we all have these parts. None of them are bad. They're all well-intentioned. And so Bryce is not Bryce. Bryce is a collection of a few dozen you know, 30, 50 prominent parts that come in depending mm. on the circumstances, again, okay. based on the context of the environment. Yeah. And so what we do is as my clients are hitting resistance, so in the case of uh, resistance or conflict, we will typically work with these parts. They are, tend to want to protect us, right? So um, Schwartz would call them uh, firefighters, mm. which try to numb us okay. from, or like try to get the pain and the, the fear to go like to subside or managers mm. where they come in and they help us manage the situation. So underneath, we don't have to feel a certain set of emotions or feelings, sensations that we felt way earlier in life when oh, these, these okay. parts started to come online. Mm -hmm. So when I go back to that point in the interview of me standing at the top of the hill, yeah. That was all my, like a lot of my parts. And so going back to your question around like decision making, what we'll often find is where, what are these parts that are getting in their way of, of, of their creativity? Are there, of some, their are, are there some parts that show up more consistently? Yeah. That are blockers? So, so, so let me give you an example. Um, today I met with an investor, he left a firm. Um, this is just a friend. We're sure. just catching yeah. up. Left, left a you know top tier firm. He's now doing his own thing. Mm -hmm. um, he's been at it for a few years, and he was just explaining that, like, as the context of his life has shifted, multiple kids, um, wife running a uh, wife running a nonprofit, um, you know, like his experience is changing, yeah. and the patterns that are emerging are changing. I bet, yeah. And so it's like you can, and this is like 
for me, like being in venture where I was at RRE and it was one thing, I was at primary, it was another mm -hmm. thing. And what I notice is a lot of these are just patterns and projections from different parts of my life that are blocking, um, frankly, like my resourcefulness, my creativity, my curiosity, mm -hmm. my ability to calm myself in intense situations. The other thing that we'll do in a con coaching container is just slow it down. Like, breathe. Like, like... Do you get, find resistance to slowing down in most of these people? Or oh, are they yeah. looking for Well, that's for why it? they're coming to yeah, me. Yeah. That's why they're coming to me. Because um, there's no other context they can create to allow themselves to slow down. Yeah, it's all, yeah. It's all, it's all, we, it's all they know. It's all right. I knew. Right. I still have those parts in me alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, especially as I think, like, as I'm moving in this new season of my life and I go in these upshift modes and it's like, so I'm, I'm on, like, you know, email after the kids go to bed, like, and, and like, I have, well, I can see you're wrestling with this a little bit because you tweeted something the other day that I thought, oh, that's really interesting because I've had the same thing projected on me, which is you conscientiously name this thing downshift. Yep. And I think you put out something that was basically the effect of like, people think this isn't ambitious or they think that I, I'm not going after something ambitious or their insecurity about slowing down is getting projected on me in a way that minimizes what it is we're trying to do and the impact we're trying to yeah. have. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound oh. like something that... Oh, yeah. Totally. Because downshift was a very clear signal yes for me i was just creating what i wanted yeah. myself right right uh, aren't those often the the best things right and for and, and the other thing i would say is that um i just have seen how that speed narrative mm -hmm. just hasn't proven to be true mm. like this idea of blitz scaling like yeah. The, uh, and this is, I don't know how it is in venture world today, but when we were in venture, it was raise a few million bucks seed round, and now you have 18 months, and the clock has started, and go find a way to spend that. those as, milestones? And those milestones, and in 12 months, when you have six months cash left, yeah. hopefully you've done enough, and now you can go raise your next round. Right. Yeah. And, like, I just think that that seems kind of broken, because you're putting pressure to just get to that that next set of milestones as quickly as possible, as opposed to like really taking your time to understand the customer, the problem, live it, breathe it. Not saying that those founders haven't. It's no, just, but it's funny. I'm la I'm smiling because like when you break that narrative again, it's the shared delusion. It's like when you break that narrative, people get very very uncomfortable with that, and they immediately start to say, "Oh, well, you must not be that ambitious." You, I mean. We've lived it at Indy where it's like the minute we started talking differently about how to think about scaling like a very ambitious company, people immediately were like, oh, these are lifestyle businesses. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. yeah people, sh people really should be able to build like a million dollar, two million dollar business. Like, I don't know why you'd want to invest in those and maybe you can like do a nonprofit. And I'm like, where did we ever say that's what we were after? Where yeah. did, where did, where did we ever say that those were the kinds of outcomes but that, those, those are the narratives. But those, those are the narratives. That's what I'm narratives. saying. As soon as you violate that narrative, there's an immediate defense that goes up across the sure. entire industry that says, wait, 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 wait. No, we all agreed that this is how we're supposed to do this. And if you're out there talking a different book, then you're kind of muddying the waters for the rest yeah, of us. And not, so in yeah. doing that, like, we're going to minimize anything it is you're trying to do. Yep. Yeah. And so I, I, I just wondered if there was anything you were feeling. Downshift is obviously anti-establishment. Yes. In a lot of ways. Okay. Um, and at the same time, I don't think I've ever been ambitious, as ambitious as I am now. So and, you... and, and to me, here's why I fundamentally believe in what we're building. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea what that's what the the expression of that is ultimately going to be yeah. like the way i'm holding it is actually quite like i'm driving a car um, you're feeling through the woods but again. i'm feeling you're looking the, for your opening exactly yeah. exactly
Um, and it, and it, and as I'm sort of looking for that thing in the wilderness, what I can, what I think everybody can agree on, which I believe is why the idea is resonating with a lot of people, mm -hmm. is because the world is accelerating. It feels like it's speeding up. And you know, everybody do you has think it feels that way to everybody, or do you think that's just oh no? Who I, are I think older? it's I think it's universal. Okay. You know, cell phone, mental health yeah. um, stats with mm -hmm. teenagers with, with cell phones. Yeah. Look at, I mean, just look at the health of our population. Mm -hmm. Like things are just, are accelerating. Yeah. And what's happening is in this accelerating, like having to do the next thing. And sometimes people have, like my mother had to work two jobs out of necessity. Totally. So let's be, let's be clear. Bless her. Um, yeah. Seriously. She, what a scene. Yeah. God, God bless her. No I mean, you should have seen me as a kid. <laughs> but. But here's what I'll say: the world, the world feels like it's accelerating. Yeah. Technology is accelerating, and as we have millennials hitting midlife, that is going to be the largest generation. You know, it's it's a sandwich phase of life: yeah. raising kids, aging parents, career, yeah. cell phones in pockets, having to keep up, cost of living in America's. You know, obviously going up, it's mm -hmm. hard, you know, both parents have to work. Yeah. It's just getting harder. Yeah. And so to me, in my mind, in that confluence of factors, the only solution is like slow down. It doesn't mean stop and do mm -hmm. nothing. In some cases it does. Mm -hmm. But it means like, look, we, we can no longer just go and run our lives unconsciously. Mm -hmm. just, I just don't believe it. I just don't believe it's going to work. I don't think we're going to survive as a species if we do that. The problem is, it's never been easier to run unconsciously. Oh, this, this right, <laughs> this right here, <laughs> this right here is like the greatest. I mean, this is like soothing, numbing. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, totally. it's the best dissociative device of Incredible. all time. I tweeted this not too long ago. Like, are you using your device, or is your device using you? Mm -hmm. And so, as I think about downshift and and to me like there's a contain it's a container for some sort of expression and the expression is you can slow down and still be ambitious mm -hmm. and be effective mm -hmm. but i think it requires us to think over longer arcs of time instead of that 12 to 18 months have to hit that next milestone what does it look like to build very intentionally I hear over and over from founders, especially in this, in like it, where we are in the cycle, is, wow, I gave five to ten years of my life to something and walked away with nothing. Mm. Nothing. And how are they processing that? Well, it's a grieving process. It has to be, right? Yeah, like, wow, I spent ten years of my life, I sold the company, and the company that bought us, I was sitting on all this stock, and the market tanked, and my options are underwater, and they're completely worthless. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I want to ask, it's like, well, what's the kind of business you want to build? What's the kind of life you want to have? Like, are those answers changing over the, the course of your coaching? I, I, I see more entrepreneurs today wanting to embrace not saying I don't want to work hard, but I want to do it in a way that's more sustainable, mm -hmm. especially as like this last wave of founders are becoming parents. Yeah. It's like, I don't just want to work. Mm -hmm. Like I want to be there for my kids. Like I want to see my kids grow up. Yeah. And that, just that, that alone creates enough structure to, to like not have to sleep in the office. Yeah. You know, it was interesting when we, you know, I did one of these with Delian and his wife, Nadia. Yeah, I saw that episode. And, you know, they made this point, which was like, having kids doesn't have to decrease your ambition. It can actually amplify it. It just means you have to be more mindful of where you spend your energy. It's, it's all about attention allocation yeah. and, and resource allocation. Yeah, right. You know, and for me, it's about attention and time and... You know, frankly, you got to say no a lot, yeah. right? And and I think that's what I'm talking about with this new the around downshift. A big part of it is setting boundaries. Mm. 
you know, how are you effective at saying no? Like when I was a venture investor, I really struggled saying no. Now it's like I get emails all the time. So, hey, coffee. Hey, I love downshift. Wow, this is how like do you say no how contrary. I just say I have, I have a family. I'm trying to <laughs> build a new business that's right. still in the incubation phase. Um, I want to take care of my health. I want right. to get seven hours of sleep. Like, I'm just not right now. I can't. How did downshift grow out of the coaching stuff? Because it feels, maybe, it's, t- the, I'll, maybe I'll, it's the same thing, but it feels, I'll, I'll, it feels distinctly different I'll, from I'll t- what you were doing with the yeah, coaching. Yeah, so it happened by accident. So I was running a, gr- uh, a, 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 a group coaching circle. There was a YC founder, and he came to me and said, can we, can we talk offline? Uh-huh. And I said, sure. Right. What's going on? And he's like, well, you've been pretty public about your transition. And I'm wondering, you know, like, you know, raise capital from Thrive, YC, like. Living the dream. Bur- kind of burnt out. Oh, fascinating. Okay. And like, we've been pivoting and I'm not sure if I can stay at it. Yeah. And I said, yeah, sure, let's talk. And I helped them over a four month period, go through the conversation with his co-founders, basically help him exit the company oh, wow. and begin to identify what was important for him at that point. It was not FU money, mm-hmm. it was financial security. Yeah. Like more state, like financial stability is a better way to say it. Yeah. And he's like, I wanna go get a job at big tech. And he ended up at Apple. And that was the first time I did this. And then about six months later, I get a random email from a serial entrepreneur previously backed by uh, Sequoia and Social Capital. Okay. And he, uh, it was January 1st and said, I'm only using 20, and he had been working for a big public tech company in like a senior director product role. Okay. It's like, I'm only using 20% of my brain. Crazy. Not like I need to quit. Yeah, He's yeah. like, I want to just use yeah. more capacity in my brain. And we worked together for over a year. And I helped him leave the company through a sabbatical and support him in starting his next business wow. where he went and raised a big round from really amazing investors. Yeah. And now he's building that. And I was like, Oh, actually, I really love this. Yeah, so gratifying. There was something about that transitional. Yeah, liminal and that, space. because it, it it's like no longer about the having to like run the business and and yeah. the conflict and the and all the it was just I want to live it. Was a, just a, a world different, of possibility. And there was less posturing. Yeah, it was more multi-dimensional. Like this this work touched on all the dimensions: family, you know, health. I just took to it and loved it. It happened organically. And then, you know, just naturally it started happening where, you know, a a third of my practice. And then finally I'm like, everything I'm reading is about this. Mm -hmm. All my personal work that I've been doing. this being those transitional Yeah, this idea of these transitional phases, um, helping people with burn, like high performers with burnout. Mm -hmm. And um, I made the pivot. So about almost two years ago. And this is when I knew I was on to something, Bryce. Like there, there are moments where I'm like, ah, oh, there's something here where one day I get an email from my schlaff.co mm-hmm. email address. Yeah. Oh, from, from the website, the, the form, where it's like, hey there, I'm in a transition. I'm interested in learning more about what you do. Mm-hmm. I really like your site. Mm-hmm. Normally, normally I get these like really heartfelt, vulnerable emails. Yeah, same. Um, just about where they are in their journey. Oh. <laughs> and this was so short. Normally, I just delete those. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm gonna go on LinkedIn and I'm gonna look up this person. And he was a CEO of a Fortune 100 company. Wow. That had retired a year before. Okay. I can't say obviously the sure. name. Uh, Fortune 100 CEO. That is like I established a family office. Uh, it's been two years since I've been out of the seat. Um, I don't know what to do with myself. And I, and you know, we met a bunch of time. And I'm like, if someone like that to a YC founder 
is like something is speaking to them mm. about the support. And again, I go back to 2017. I walked into my the office at RE and I resigned. Yeah. And I honestly believe this, that if I had had someone like me to usher me through that transition, I would probably still be in venture. What would you have said to yourself then, now that you understand oh, I would these have transitions? Said, like, I would how have would said, you have managed I would the have transition? Said, I would have said, time out, slow down. No decisions. I just didn't have like the self-confidence mm. and the ability to actually like step back yeah. and like really assess what's important to me. Like, do I want to start my own firm? Do I want like, what's yeah, so the right? That version of Schlaff walks into your office today. Cause I'm telling you right now, at least I probably have several dozen friends who sold their company, wound down their company, wound down their firm, decided to like, that are just in this period of uncertainty where they feel like they are just drifting. Yeah. There's no structure. There, there's no, but there's also no pressure because they've all done reasonably well. So there's no pressure to like, but there is an internal pressure. 100% because right? these are achievers. These are people who feel like there's so much they're more sled dogs. 100%. Right. And so they want to. They're looking for. A they're slide to deeply pull. uncomfortable. Yeah. With where they're at. For me, as I was going through that that transition, so I think back to young Steve, yeah. 2017 that we were just talking about. That version of Steve had to be freaked out. I was. Yeah. I was actually. There was a. I period. would have been freaked out because you were. You're at that point. You're like mid 30s. Yeah. Yeah. I was living in my head. Yeah. Like I. And this is part of my philosophy around downshift, which is we need to get into our bodies, mm -hmm. right? Like we're we're not just like um, machines where we're operating a brain and walking around the world. Like we are creatures, animals with a peripheral nervous system that is taking in way more information in any given moment than our brain can even sense and process. Mm -hmm. We're sensing creatures, yeah. right? And there are four windows of knowing. There's feeling, there's imagining, there's sensing, and there's thinking. Mm. Steve, many years ago, and most of my clients, just in the four windows of knowing, just think. Mm. And that when we slow down it, and we start to cultivate more of like an embodied presence where we can feel that intuitive hit of like, yeah, this, this feels right mm. versus, oh, this is actually a pattern of mine that's coming on top and clouding my judgment. Mm. And, and being able to witness our experience while we're in the experience and so what we do at Downshift is like almost like teach people how to access more of their, their innate intelligence and then kind of sense and feel their way forward. So rather than like, in six months, I'm going to have a job and it's going to look like this. It's But that's what people do. Yeah. And, and to me, part of the philosophy is I, I love Steve, uh, Stephen Johnson, uh, how ideas happen, yeah, innovation builds off of other innovations. So like, you know, using the phone is like a perfect example, like the mobile phone, you know, chip sizes had to get to a certain yep. size, GPS, and then the OS had to have certain capabilities and be open, and now Uber's, uh, uh, and so. Yeah, Chris, Chris Anderson back in the day said, you know, all the new hardware devices and all these new capabilities in the phone were the peace dividend of e the cell phone. Exactly, wars. exactly. Yeah. Well, really well said, and so the adjacent possible is used to talk about like innovation and evolution that when we have a new innovation it will eventually or a new insight it will basically open up you know a new level and so think about it as you know this is the analogy uh johnson uses is like think about a door a set of doors mm -hmm. so at any given time there are there's like almost an infinite amount of doors floating around us mm -hmm. as jerry once told me you know, I asked him, like, how do you learn Buddhism? Like, how do I, I want to learn more about it. He said, you know, the Buddha taught there were 10,000 doors to the Dharma. I kid you not. The point is just to pick one yeah. and, ta and take a step. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot inherent in, in our philosophy, whereas, like, when we help these people learn this, like, more, like, of a sensing capacity is sensing the doors that are mm -hmm. actually around you. And then you step through 
as an experiment and now it opens up a new room with a new set of doors and experiences and learnings about yourself and and so then you follow curiosity energy did this excite me mm. do i feel contrict and and so after enough of opening these doors what starts to magically happen is a new a new path emerges which is fascinating because that's almost antithetical to how the world of entrepreneurship has turned out. Right, because there's very little sensing. Yeah, there's a lot of like. There's playbooks. good. Re there's good <laughs> reason for this because we're just we're a society of disembodied people that have basically just valued our ability to think versus sense and feel. I think like this idea of like using our senses, being open to what emerges, having a North Star that you're oriented towards. Like I'm, I'm fixated on the problem that we're trying to solve at Downshift, which is helping. Um, this is a pure chaos. I love that. <laughs> love that. I think is there something really about sensing and being open to what what's emerging mm -hmm. both within us in the container mm -hmm. but it, re it requires an entirely new orientation like one of the things i'm thinking about is like i've been starting to dabble in taoism i'm not dangerous enough to talk about it in depth but sure. the yin yang concept yeah right like yang is forward motion and progress it's a lot of like the masculine energy yeah right i think what what what's going to happen is you look at a lot of the issues in in the world today and it's i think a, a lot of it's at, as a result of that energy of we've we've over indexed towards this one type of energy and the pendulum and this is a Taoist concept right mm -hmm. where you know basically once you get to an extreme what happens yeah. inevitably you have to you know, go back to the, yeah. you know, you find equilibrium and then probably to a different extreme. Sure. And so um, I think what's going to happen and it's, a, it's for a man to start to embrace like that yin energy and saying, it's not that I'm denouncing like stopping and that, that yang. It's, but you're seeing what happens when you do. Yeah. When you embrace that, people are like, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. No, 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 no. That's not how this is supposed yeah. to work. Yeah. I think it's just this this idea of we don't have to we don't have to follow the scripts that were handed to us yeah. like there can be elements of the script that we incorporate but like we don't have to mm -hmm. but how do you do it in a new way based on the context of your life and what really matters to you yeah a He's lot of people the when they're downshifting they are thinking very clearly yeah. about what it is they want and then they step back into the game. Yeah, and, and, par like, and, pa oh, and part of what we... Everything I just said, it's go time. And part of the program, just so you know, like part of what we're creating and we're, we're, we're building it on the fly. Yeah. Like we're, I don't have all the answers, is there's actually, a, and this is for the, the next cohort, we're actually building up shifting yeah, into it. A, yeah. Where again, it's this, I, I keep on coming yeah. back to, it's a cycle. Yeah. And so it's like, how do you upshift? Well, it acknowledges the yin and the yang. Yeah, exactly. You're not and downshifting permanently. You're downshifting to... Um, um, you're not breaking. When you downshift, it's yeah. not breaking. You're just switching gears while you're going through a turn so you can accelerate. And that's what this is about. This is about like changing gears mm -hmm. such that you can begin to accelerate not from the place that everyone thinks you should should be yeah but from that place of this is what's important to me and i'm yeah. going to do it my own way mm -hmm. and i'm willing to bet on myself and i'm willing to stand in my truth and my power and and go for it you have a magic wand to wave over the start venture world first startup world second universe of like tech founders what are you changing as part of that yeah, I, I think it's pretty clear. I think, um, I think venture belongs in the world. For sure. Like yeah, I, 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 I believe it's an essential asset class. Mm -hmm. I would make it very clear about what kinds of businesses venture is designed to fund. Okay, how and would you articulate that today? What are those? I think businesses that are um, truly building frontiers mm -hmm. and fully like pushing the envelope where 
specific amounts of capital are required. Interesting, okay. And, because and, you see, I mean, well, part, well, part the other, of that's the, the first thing you're bringing up is because you're seeing a bunch of companies that shouldn't. The, the, the other thing I would say, so there, there's that. Yep. Um, so if you're going to build, you know, Zipline or a new chip, AI chip company or um, something that has real network effects that where that actually like really matters, mm -hmm. venture. Mm -hmm. I think there's a place for venture where you're making concentrated bets on really great people. Mm -hmm. But what happened is that became default yes. versus really discerning like who are the great people and what are the truly special ideas. Mm -hmm. It was just money trying to find, you know. Yeah, it ends up being people you like. Yeah, so, so to me it would be a lot more clarity on the kinds of businesses. that, And I think, I think VCs have a responsibility to identify that because, you know, I think it's, I've seen a lot of e-commerce founders that wish that they went a very different path, yeah. right? And it turns out venture, traditional venture is not great for those not kinds great. of businesses. Yeah. And some of this is, is hindsight, sure. but some sort of definition. Then I would say, um, I would like to see more firms that are smaller, more deliberate and being willing to back companies mm -hmm. that, uh, and people and ideas that um, might not go the traditional path. Mm. And like I think about uh, an entrepreneur that I backed um, as part of this angel fund, uh, Dan Shipper of Every. Oh, sure, yeah, of course. Right, love Dan. Mm -hmm. And like, he's just someone I love and mm -hmm. I've always wanted to work. There's mutual love and admiration and like, he was pretty clear. I don't know if this is going to be a venture style company, mm -hmm. and to but like I want to build something and I want to pour my life into it and I'm going to give it everything and like there should be capital that's designed for people like him, mm -hmm. and there should be business that like for me like I think about downshift. Do I want to go raise venture? No. Why? Do, well, we talked about it. I know, but why? Be, now well, the cameras be, are well, rolling. Yeah, here's the reason because I don't know how I would spend it. Interesting. And okay. I and I know where I know where where we're onto something and there's there's something here, but I can't say for sure. Would you feel the pressure to say for sure once you'd taken that money? No. no. I think I think because I'm now at a point where there's a level of comfort with myself mm -hmm. to know like I don't want to eat my own bullshit. Totally. And, but I think like for me, I would want to know exactly what are the experiments that I would want to run mm -hmm. and where that would go to. And the other thing is, is like, is there a way where we view this as the last money that we ever raise? Yeah. Even if it's not the case. Are you hearing that more from your clients? Like, are they rethinking their relationship to venture? Some of my some of my clients are okay. So like this 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 founder that I talked about earlier, this crypto founder, yeah. is like already thinking about his next company. Sure, yeah. And he's like, it's going to be in the AI space, and it's going to be AI enabled. Mm. I'm going to basically build a company that's AI native in the back end, and like, I'm not going to have to build nearly as big of a team, and like, I'm hell is like, is he seeing it now? The way that his company is built, yeah, because bet. he has you know, 30 to 50 million on his cap table and right. he, he can't make some of the decisions that he wants to make. And mm. so he's like, now when I do this again, I'm going to do it a lot, a lot more oh, thoughtfully so that I can have more agency mm -hmm. around the, the strategic decisions of the business. Do you think you have to live that from an entrepreneur's perspective. So I was actually having this conversation uh, th this morning is what I think is that there's yeah, cycles. That was, that was you and your cycles and but, you're a cyclist. Yes. But if you look at like um, this wave of founders that have been in the last decade, mm -hmm. last 15 years, especially the ones that um, maybe venture wasn't so friendly to them. Yeah. Um, starting to like rethink, well, if I built, like I think about my wife as a good example. She by no means was like a venture scale, but she got up to 30 mil in revenue yeah. and like definitely raised, I want to say like 15 million. Mm -hmm. She's definitely thinking about it from the standpoint of like, when I build my next company, am I gonna go try to raise traditional capital? Or am I gonna, like, 
she's leaning towards the the, the alternative, which yeah. is like, I want to I want to go after a different type of capital. Mm. And so I think I think the market's hungry for that. I know that it would be hard, at least right now, for me to go to a venture firm and look them in the eye and say, "Give me a million bucks," so that I I just I just can't promise that that level of return. Nor is it the kind of company I want to build. I think that's the interesting question, right? I mean, I, I think that, that that's the more fun. That's the more fun part I think of that, it. That's that's why it's always interesting to me to hear how people, particularly frame indie, but I think in the broader context of kind of the funding landscape, in that so much is in, is uh, implied based on how you fund your company. Yeah. And yet, as you know, the best, most interesting companies, the biggest ones that are dominating markets now have been this dance between vision and possibility. Yeah. And yet, you know, how many founders have to walk into that first pitch meeting and say like, here's my plan to get to a $10 billion. Well, let me give market. you, right. Let me give you. Like, I actually think that is, that is suffocating entrepreneurship. Yeah. Because I think there's so. Well, it, 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 limit, it limits so, creativity. It limits creativity and it limits surface area of non-obvious, non-scaled markets you were around when Facebook was coming up. Like there was no TAM on social networks. No, and if he start, like he didn't even start with Facebook. No, the, the TAM on Uber when they pitched were taxis. No, not, black cars, not even taxis. But today we've now conditioned these entrepreneurs to be like, oh, only go after kind of obviously massive markets. Or I think to your point around venture, incredibly technical, solution-oriented. Yeah, and frankly, now we're getting into like weapon systems. Oh, I know. I've, heard, I've been hearing that. Yeah. <laughs> and we're yeah. getting into like... You're the second person today that mentioned No, that. I mean, this is the most en vogue thing in venture right now is to, you know, to be going after, you know, it's, it's Lux's model applied to everything with way less smart people. Yeah. And it's the new way to kind of hack venture. It's like yeah. you're either going with your AI thing or you're going with like... Your freaking what American dinosaurs? Yeah, it's yeah. like what? Yeah, the amount of experience and credentialing you have to have to credibly go after some of those markets. I think now SpaceX has been around long enough that there's now this diaspora and alumni network that are now trained on and some of these hard problems to kind of unlock it. But I mean, I think I think the bigger point is like in my career, some of the most interesting biggest outcomes have been totally unobvious and it feels like we've conditioned everyone to go after very obvious markets right now and to only go after those things which yeah. which, t which removes like the possible and so you know i mean i always take with a grain of salt when someone frames indie as like you know non-venture path because that, that immediately says in our world at least it's like less ambitious and maybe less well impactful. we're in yeah, the same camp the same brother. Boat. yeah and so i always bristle in the same way you probably bristle but it's also one of those things that I got to figure out how to lean into as well, because there's a real sense of possibility in that, that I think is missing in venture today. And I think it's probably why you were so disillusioned in those pitch meetings where you're like, dude, another freaking like take on a CRM. Yeah. Another this, another that. And yet we've, everybody's kind of trying to hack the algorithm of VC investing to their benefit. I think the next wave is this kind of wave of founders who are coming off of it like, huh, had that lived experience like your wife, had that lived experience with venture. I knew how that made me feel. I knew what it made me do to that business that either worked or didn't work. There's still something in them they got to get out. Yeah. But, you know, maybe less contained, maybe less constrained to a timeline to do that in. Yeah. But, like, but hold on. Like, as I'm listening to you, I think of two things. Okay. Navy SEALs. And and there are a number of great principles. A, a good friend of mine is, was a former SEAL for a decade. One is, how do you eat an elephant? One, One bite, bite at, at a time. time. That's right. The other is, uh, slow is smooth. Yes. Smooth is fast. So slow is fast. Right. Yes. This is, yes. A good friend of mine, really well-known founder in New York, he and I were having dinner almost two years ago. And he's like, man, the next year is going to be brutal. That's what he said to me. Okay. And I said, well, how are you going to make it brutal? 
how are you making it brutal for yourself? And that hit him hard. He's like, oh. something that I, I, I see, I'm not, and I'm not tied to the story of this being the case, but it's like, most of us are gonna look back on these years and say, wow, these were amazing years. Mm -hmm. And yet I think we could enjoy them 10 to 20%, 30% more than we are. Mm. How do we do that now instead of having to look back and long for the extra yeah, 20 and I, to 30% I, I think, back? I think, it's, I think it's, it's, it's really connecting with what, what, we, like, what matters to us. Yeah what we really want. Yeah. And well, I think that, you know, I mean, I go back to, like, I think about your friend, and obviously, like, I, I, this is the book I'm building now with Indy, like, part of how you insulate yourself from that, this is gonna be a crushing, like, like this year is gonna be brutal, or that idea of, like, being totally beholden to the swings of the market is just that idea of some independence, that idea of, like, okay, no one actually knows how big these things, these outcomes are going to end up being. But if I can control a bit more of what's going on around me, and you know, this was this was came from my experiences of VC, which was just like you watch how fickle it is. So much is out of your control. But you think about, I mean, I think about the way you're building your business now. Like you're keeping it in in your control. Like. You can hire more, you can hire less. So, so, you so. You don't have pressure to spend. You yeah. Can, you can spend if you want. You don't have to spend so, if you don't so, want. So, so, so do you, uh, you know, Brian Eno. Yeah, he, the, yeah. the artist. Yeah, amazing. He had uh, the Oblique Strategy. Have you ever heard of Oblique Strategies? No. He and another artist used to. And we don't, we, just to be clear, we do not do show notes. So if you want book yes. recommendations or links, you're just yeah, going to have to. You're just going to have to write them in. <laughs> you're going to write them down. <laughs> uh, but e Brian Eno, and I forget his collaborator, but they used to have all of these notes around their studios of like little sayings. Mm. It's almost like creative prompts mm. to like help them unstuck themselves. Oh, I love it. Yeah, yeah. At Downshift, we, we gave the members uh, a deck. And I remember I pulled out a card that now hangs above my computer that says, um, building a brick, not a wall. Oh, fascinating. What does that mean to you? And to me, building a brick, not a wall, is that it's about the process mm. and looking at the thing that I'm doing in front of me versus getting lost in this like big, grand picture yeah, and that brick might be a fence. It might be a house. It might be like you don't need to yeah. judge what that brick I is. Have no, I have no idea. Well, I think the other thing that we wildly underestimate is a brick can be something completely different depending on the hands that it's in. Yes. Right? And so it's, it's like it could, you know, if your ambition for that brick is to just sell the brick to the next person, if your ambition for the brick is to build a wall or, you know, something in the garden, that's the interesting thing is I but, mature as an investor, the more I realize it's, it's really about the individual and their ambition, not how much of it they can like project, but how much is inherent in them. Yeah. People are feeling this all and, over the and place. And it's, it's going to continue at an accelerating pace. No, I, I mean, not, not even about my work, no, no, no. about this idea. No, 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 I agree. About this idea. I totally agree. Yeah. And I think that's part of, yeah, I mean, I think if you go and we, I did a presentation last year called the Indie Era of Startups, and a big part of it was the idea that we're going to, more and more people are going to try to, tra you know, they're going to be compelled to transition out of this one-size-fits-all rat race that yeah. the startup ecosystem has become. It strikes me that we really, there's so much more we could be doing in entrepreneurship, and yet we have oh, this yeah. very narrow filter we run it all through. Yeah. And so I think more and more people are going to feel that. I think more and more people are going to sit up and question the ultimate value of the work that they're doing. I think there's going to be enough people who, like you, had money show up in their account and were like, nothing's... Yeah. Like, it's literally just numbers on a screen. This morning, as I was leaving my house, sunrise, early, early morning, yeah. and... Um, um, driving alongside like kind of but it elevated a cornfield mm -hmm. and the sun's like coming up and there's this sprawling like you know, acres upon acres of just like corn as far as I can see it was just this like moment where I was like it just like kind of took my breath away and it's like 
no amount in the bank account can reproduce that just like that human experience mm. and i'm just that's why part of me is like loves this idea of slowing down getting into nature is because when i when i do it it's i just i my breath is taken away yeah. and money or success or accolades just can't reproduce that for me yeah and and like i'm hungry i want to i want to go after well, i think you've yeah. swung to both ends of the pendulum and now it's you're going to find your equilibrium. Yeah, exactly. Because I know there's a lot more ambition in there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe one day I'll be an indie company, if you'll have me. You never know. Stay tuned. Oh, my gosh. I love you, bud. Mm. Seriously. Thanks for sharing yeah. all this stuff. I really yeah. think it matters. 